we're live. We are resuming our activities. Um, and unfortunately, we will have our last talk. Although fortunately, our last keynote speaker, uh, our last keynote speaker is a killer. Actually, he needs no introduction. I could just name him. Also, I could present him in many alternative ways. My choice here is to present him by his intellectual offspring. And he is indeed literally a prolific author. He has covered a large range of subjects with an incredible profoundness, but at the same time with crystal clear argumentation and vivid prose. Just to mention some of his books, he is the author of Pyrrhonian Skepticisms, Moral Skepticism, Moral Psychology Volume 1, The Evolution of Morality, Adaptations and Inanness, Moral Psychology Volume 2, The Cognitive Science of Morality, Intuition and Diversity, Moral Psychology Volume 2, The Neuroscience of Morality, Emotion, Brain Disorders and Development, Moral Psychology Volume 4, Free Will and Moral Responsibility, Morality, Eval God, Finding Consciousness, The Neuroscience of Ethics and, and Law of Severe Brain, Think Again, How to Reason and Argue, he has many other highly influent books with extremely important co-authors and edited or a bunch of books. He has also published a myriad of papers in the best peer-reviewed journals. But then, as intellectual sons, he has more than books. He has also the graduate students he forms. Even if he once defended that some moral beliefs can be justified out of a modest contrast class, but no moral beliefs can be justified out of an extreme contrast class, the fact that he includes his graduated students as part of his co-authors show his practical chivalry and the noblest sense of this word. We welcome Walter Sinat Armstrong and Claire Simons. The words of you. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. But I must say, it's not chivalry. It's, it's they do all the work. The graduate students are the ones that actually go out and do the work. And I just kind of make a few comments about what they have done. Here, let me uh, share my screen. Uh, and then... Can you see that now? Good. Um, so thanks so much for having me and for that introduction. It's been a, a wonderful week. I've been to a number of the other sessions uh, and I'm sad to see it in, but I'm happy that um, hopefully we will be able to come to Brazil uh, and meet each other in person and talk more about these uh, issues, uh, none of which have been resolved this week and none of which will be resolved in my talk today. Um, uh, I do list four co-authors there. Claire Simmons is with me uh, and will participate at certain points. Uh, Paul Rarin and John Dylan Haynes are both in Europe. Uh, Paul's in the Netherlands, John's in uh, Berlin in, in Germany. Uh, so it's way too late for them to uh, participate at this point, but they certainly deserve mention uh, because they have uh, helped uh, in, in very profound ways uh, with this project. So it's late on a Friday night, uh, and that means that you're probably all quite hungry. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is provide a feast for you all. I hope you all recognize uh, these dishes, um, but we're gonna go through an appetizer in the upper left, for me, the appetizer is to outline the basic challenge. Uh, the second section will be uh, the salad course, which is philosophical analysis. We're going to uh, draw some distinctions and give some philosophical arguments. Uh, but the main course uh, in the lower left is going to be psychological experiments. Uh, and we will talk about two different experiments, uh, one of which solves a problem with the first one. Uh, and we will end with dessert talking about practical implications. I just want to point out that all of these dishes are vegetarian and moreover, they are all Brazilian. Uh, I hope you recognize the dishes uh, on the slide. 
And instead of just talking for an hour, hour and a half for way too long, uh, especially for a Friday evening, what I'm going to do is stop after each section and take a couple of questions. I don't want to engage in a full hour long discussion uh, at, in the breaks, but I do want to take a couple of questions just to wake you up and give you a chance to tell me what you don't understand so you'll be able to follow uh, more easily. Um, so let's start with an example. The example is well known in the United States. You might have heard it in Brazil. It's the case of Leopold and Loeb, uh, who in 1924 kidnapped and murdered uh, a young boy named Bobby Franks. Uh, and they confessed to the crime and they pled guilty. So the only real question at trial was what kind of punishment they should receive. And they had one of the most famous lawyers uh, ever in the United States, Clarence Darrow. Uh, and he argued uh, that they should not receive the death penalty, but should get, instead get life imprisonment. Uh, he argued for 12 hours. Um, they could really keep going back then. Uh, just one example of an argument uh, is the quotation at the bottom of the slide. I am trying to say to this court that these boys are not responsible for this, that their act was due to, and he lists out many different causes, uh, and asking this court not to visit the judgment of its wrath upon them for things for which they are not to blame. So he's going from the fact that their act was due to many causes, was caused by many things, their upbringing, the circumstances, the books they read, and drawing the conclusion that they're not responsible and not to blame. So that's just one example of the practical importance of the issues that we are going to talk about uh, tonight. Now, I want to put it in a more philosophical way as an argument. So the basic challenge, I think, takes this form which is familiar to many of you, but I wanna lay out the particular version that I'm gonna be talking about. Every act is either determined or random. I put it that way because some people say, well, quantum mechanics has shown that things are not really determined. So I wanted the or random in there, but that won't really play a lot of role in the discussion. Then the next premise in the argument, premise two, that's why I have P2 there, means premise two. Any agent whose act is determined is not free. Well, how can you be free if you're determined? People would say. Premise three, any agent whose act is random is also not free. Because if it's just random, if it results from some quantum mechanical you know, electron leaping energy levels. I have no control over that. If it's truly random, how can I be free? Because I can't control it. Therefore, this follows from premises one, two, and three, no agent is ever free. But now let's add another premise, premise five, any agent who is not free is not responsible. Responsibility requires freedom. So if you're not free, you're not responsible. And then you get conclusion six. Therefore, no agent's ever responsible. Because if they're not free, as conclusion four says, and they have to be free in order to be responsible, as premise five says, then no agent's ever responsible. But wait a minute. If they're not responsible, then they shouldn't be in prison for that act. After all, if I, for example, have a car accident because you uh, cut my brake lines so I couldn't stop my car, then I'm not responsible. And therefore, I should not be put in prison you know, for what happened. It was you, not me. You're the one who's responsible. That's the person who should be punished. I'm not responsible. So I should not be imprisoned. I say imprisoned because People argue a lot about how to use the word punishment, uh, but I'm going to just say they shouldn't be imprisoned for that act. Maybe they should be put into a prison because they're dangerous, 
But that's not because of that act. That's because they're dangerous. You could do that if they hadn't committed the act at all, if you somehow knew they were dangerous. So I think a lot of people would, uh, would put it that way. It just removes some unclarity. And it follows conclusion A, no agent should be imprisoned for any act. So people who commit murders should not be imprisoned because they committed murder. People who committed rape should not be imprisoned because they committed rape. Now, I think most people want to avoid that last conclusion. The question is, how do you get out of it? And there are a lot of possibilities. These are the familiar possibilities uh, in the philosophical literature. Uh, libertarians deny the first premise. They deny that determinism is true. They think that humans can act without being caused to act in the way that they do. So they can accept that if you were determined, you wouldn't be free, but they just deny that you're determined so they can say yes to conclusion four, you are free. And then they can accept premise five, and they usually do, that responsibility requires freedom, because they say one reason that I'm so keen on denying determinism is that that would mean I'm not free. Uh, and if I'm not free, I'm not responsible. So they seem to accept premise five because they want to reach conclusion six, namely that people are sometimes responsible murderers and rapists being examples. In contrast, soft determinists accept determinism, but they deny that determinism excludes freedom. They think that determinism and freedom are compatible. So they can also deny conclusion four, which is to say they deny that there's no freedom, so they claim that there is freedom. And they also accept premise five, that in order to be responsible, you have to be free. So they can deny conclusion six, they think people are responsible. Hard determinists accept determinism, think that determinism excludes freedom. So they deny that anyone is ever free. They think that responsibility requires freedom. So they deny that anyone is ever responsible. Well, what do you do with murderers and rapists? Well, you put them in jail because they're not safe, because they're dangerous people. You're not putting them because of what they did, you're putting them in prison because of the kind of person they are, a dangerous person, okay? So these are the classic views um, on free will and responsibility. The problem is that all of these views, if you look at it again, they all accept premise five. They all accept that you can't be responsible without being free. But recently, some people, including John Fisher, have questioned that premise. And I want to question it in my talk tonight. John calls himself a semi-compatibilist. What he means by that is that he denies premise five, that any agent who is not free is not responsible, or it's contrapositive that responsibility requires freedom. So he denies conclusion six that no ever, uh, agent is ever responsible. He thinks that some agents are responsible, even if they're not free. But he doesn't take a stand on whether people really are free or not. Uh, he neither denies nor accepts the first part of that basic challenge that I outlined before. He says, I'm not going to take a stand on whether agents really are free or not, uh, because it doesn't really matter what matters is responsibility. Now, my view is related to that and inspired by that, uh, but it's distinct. I am starting to call my view partial compatibilism. I used to call it semi-compatibilism, and everybody said, no, no, John's view is different. And my view is different from his because I want to say that one through four are true in a sense, and yet five is not true, and that's why agents can be responsible without being free. So just to put it on that diagram that we had before, a semi-compatibilist 
is neutral with regard to premise one, doesn't accept or deny it, neutral with regard to premise two, doesn't accept or deny it, and neutral with regard to conclusion four, doesn't accept or deny it, but denies premise five and denies conclusion six. Whereas a partial compatibilist accepts premise one, accepts premise two, accepts conclusion four, denies premise five and denies six. So claims that a person is responsible without being free. I'm gonna be talking about partial compatibilism uh, for the rest of the talk, but I wanted to give John Fisher his due because he really inspired uh, this approach in many ways. What's, what's crucial is denying premise five. The traditional views did not do that, semi-compatibilism and partial compatibilism do. So why should we deny premise five? I'm just gonna give two quick counter examples, and then I'm gonna give you a chance to ask questions uh, about them, okay? The first counter example is um, about a false promise. Okay, imagine that I've never learned to drive a car and I've never owned a car. I'm just incapable of driving a car because I don't know how to do it and I don't own one. But you mistakenly believe that I own a car and that I can drive that car, that I'm able to. So you asked me to drive you in my car to the airport right now. You have a flight to catch. Uh, you can imagine either that I'm the only one who can drive you to the airport right now, or that you could call an Uber, but you'd rather go with me. Either way, you ask me to drive you to my uh, to the airport in my car right now, uh, because the plane um, is going to leave soon. And I say, sure, I promise to drive you in my car to the airport. Okay. Why would I do that when I know that I can't? Because I'm a jerk. I'm a bad person. I want you to miss your flight. And sure enough, my plan works and you do miss your flight, okay? Now I would say in this case that I'm responsible for breaking my promise. Not only that, I'm responsible for your missing your flight. So for example, if you had to uh, buy a, another ticket on a different flight later, I would feel that I ought to pay compensation for the cost to you, that I should pay for your new ticket, okay? But I am never, not at any time, able or free to keep my promise. There's no time when I'm able to keep my promise. There's no time when I'm free to keep my promise. Now, of course, I was free not to make the promise, but what I'm responsible for is breaking my promise. Suppose that I made this promise, but later I said, oh, I'm being a jerk. I'm gonna get an Uber to drive you to the airport. Then I wouldn't be responsible for breaking my promise or for missing your flight. Right. So it's not merely that I'm responsible for making my promise. I'm also responsible for breaking my promise and also for your. The harm that comes to you because you missed your flight. OK, so that's counterexample number one. That's responsibility without freedom. That's what premise five said was not possible. If you don't like that one, let me give you another. I could give you more, but I'm only gonna give you two. Not trying. So let's stick to driving to the airport. And I promise to drive you to the airport right now, but this time I do know how to drive. I do own a car, but only one car. So my daughter wants to use the car to go to a movie, who knows? So what she does is she hides my keys where I cannot find them. OK, I don't know about your children, but this is the kind of thing my daughter might do. Oh, wait, I shouldn't have said that. I'm being recorded. OK, I hope she doesn't listen to this. But anyway, she hides my keys so I cannot find 
my keys, and that means I cannot drive my car, and it's the only car, so I cannot drive you to the airport. But I don't know that she hid those keys, and I'm still a jerk. So what I do is I sit and watch a movie, say. So I never even try to find my keys. I never try to drive you to the airport. I don't make any effort. I never form an intention to do any of those things because I want you to miss your flight, okay? Now, in that case, again, I would say that I am responsible for not keeping my promise and I'm responsible for your missing your flight, but I'm not free to keep my promise because I'm not gonna be able to find my keys even if I did try. I am free to try to keep my promise. I'm free to will to keep my promise, but if I try, I'm gonna fail. So I'm not free to keep my promise. And what I'm responsible for is keeping my promise. So again, we have a case of responsibility without freedom, and that is supposed to uh, refute or at least cause problems for premise five. And that explains why semi-compatibilists and partial compatibilists deny premise five uh, in the original argument. Now, I think it's Friday night. You need a break. I'll take a couple of questions now if anybody has it. I'm not sure how to handle these questions. Uh, I think someone might have to tell them to me because I can't see the chat. Are there any questions about those examples or about the positions that I explained? Feel free, the audience, to, to make any questions. Renato has one. Uh, Walter, hi. Hi. I, I would ask you one thing. What would be your position then if you tried and you couldn't find, then you wouldn't be responsible, right? Certainly, I yeah, I think that would show that I was not responsible because I would not be a bad person at that point. My act would not show that I had a character defect. It would show that my daughter's a bad person. But the fact that I don't try at all suggests that I'm a bad person who needs to be uh, treated accordingly. Okay. Questions regarding the the first uh, slides we were asking. Oh, my old friend yes. Santiago has a question. Good. De Please, Santiago. So, Santiago, I I'm so sad that I missed your talk, but I was in another conference. I hope they recorded it, and I'll be able to view, view it later. I'll, I'll share it with you at some point. Um, so I, I don't know what the format is, so I don't know if these are supposed to be just clarification questions or little... Uh, anything anything you want. We have two hours. Believe me, there'll be plenty of time. Okay, so two quick ones, and you, you decide whether to answer now or to have it later. So one is about, um, you know, definitions. So many people define free will as the condition for moral responsibility. You're going to deny that. So presumably there's a different definition of free will that does not compromise the truth of one, two, three, and four, I suppose. And the other question is about uh, tracing as a strategy to, to get, uh, to get right. the, 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 the freedom and responsibility cases right here. Okay, so let me go to tracing first. Uh, by tracing, what Santiago means is that I can be responsible uh, for having an accident while I'm driving drunk because I might be responsible for getting drunk and getting into the car behind the wheel while I'm drunk, knowing that I was taking a risk, okay? Uh, in this case, I, I assume you're talking about this case, I can talk about the other if you want, then uh, yes, I'm responsible for making the promise, uh, which I should not have made, I was just tricking you, uh, and that might, according to some people, uh, make me responsible uh, for breaking my promise. Uh, I've always uh, thought that that was not a good principle. Uh, and the reason is that, number one, I think I mentioned before, but let me elaborate, that I can be responsible 
for making the promise and then change my mind and go ahead and keep it. Uh, and then I'm not responsible for breaking my promise. I'm only responsible for making my promise. Uh, and so I want to distinguish the responsibility for making it from the responsibility for breaking it. Uh, and when I'm responsible for breaking it, I owe you um, compensation for breaking it, right? I don't owe you compensation simply for making it because remember, I can make it and then go ahead and keep it anyway. And then there's nothing to compensate you for. So the compensation for making it, making the promise uh, that's, that's appropriate depends on the fact that I didn't make the promise and then go ahead and try to keep it, that I actually made the promise and broke it. So it seems to me the response of the, because the compensation is owed for the costs of breaking the promise, that the responsibility has to be for breaking the promise, not simply for making it. Uh, and then the only other thing I'll say about tracing is I've always thought that there were clear counterexamples to tracing. If I, for example, uh, when I'm uh, a teenager, take a drug that I know uh, has a significant chance of making me blind, but I want to take it anyway. Uh, and so I go ahead and take it. Say it's a 10% chance of making me blind, not a you know, not one in a million, but 10%, more than I should be taking. And I become blind. I don't then become responsible for everything that I can't do because I'm blind. Like if my child somehow uh, starts to drown in front of me uh, and I don't save them because I don't see them drowning, then I'm not responsible for that, even though I am responsible for my inability to save the child. So it seems to me tracing just doesn't always, you know, go through. Um, I saved the next question uh, because I didn't do this. You would think Santiago is a plant, but he asked the next question was about people who say it's just true by definition. So that's the next thing I was going to do on the next slide. So I'll transition right into that. Um, Walter, there are two questions from oh. the audience. Then I'll wait. Okay, go ahead. On the topic of practical application, can you provide an example using a, a legal example? And the other one, if you are a bad person, are you responsible for becoming that way? Totally counterfactual. Those questions, the first one from Nick De Palma and the second one from Tom Clark. So uh, in response to Nick, uh, I think I'll just say that I'm going to wait on that because I have a whole section on that later. Uh, on, about the legal potential legal implications. Uh, but with response to, are you responsible for becoming a bad person? I think the answer is sometimes. So for example, if someone uh, becomes a thief because they have a temptation to steal things and they start doing it, and the more they do it, the more they like it, and they build up a, a habit, then they can become a really bad person because of doing things and getting away with it and uh, developing a habit of doing those bad things or even worse things. But other people are bad people, not through their own fault, but because, for example, they were abused or forced into a life of crime by their parents or their neighbors when they were young. That's a very different thing. So I think sometimes bad people are responsible for being bad and other times they're not. But that question of whether they're responsible for being a bad person is distinct from the responsibility for the, a particular act that they do as a bad person. Okay. Shall I go on now or there were there others? Why don't I go on? Okay. Please. So this was Santiago's uh, first question. Yeah, some people just go, hey, just what I mean by free is whatever's necessary for responsibility. Now, my response, I have, you know, two responses to that. One is that's not what other people mean. Philosophers do that all the time. They say, 
I'm just going to define the term so that my claim comes out true. But a lot of surveys, including some surveys that we're going to report later on, show that that's not what most ordinary people mean. Okay. Uh, and I will report the surveys and, and come back to that. Okay. But I want to also say that even if there are some philosophers who mean this and some ordinary people who mean this, that's not the only thing that they mean, okay? That's not the only kind of freedom to talk about. So I want to spend the next couple of minutes distinguishing different types of freedom using contrastivism, which I like to give credit to Fred Dretzky uh, because he's a was a colleague and a good friend. Joel Feinberg wrote about this a while back, and and I think one of his essays is you know is a great essay on what freedom actually is and means. Uh, where you want to start in this view is with the term freedom as it's used outside of the context of free will, just in everyday life. You go to a hotel and there's coffee in the lobby and you say is this coffee free and what you're saying is does it cost anything is there a barrier to me taking it i'm not allowed to take it unless i pay money you go to a theater and you say is this seat free and you're asking is there a reservation is there a barrier to me sitting here because somebody reserved it or somebody's holding it for somebody else Again, you're asking, is there a certain kind of barrier? Is there free speech in a country, Brazil or the United States? Well, that depends on whether there's a law that will prevent you from saying certain things. If there is, it's not free, but if there's no barrier to your saying it, then there is free speech. So contrastivism says that what we mean by free in all of these contexts and also in discussions of free will and free action is simply, is there a relevant kind of barrier? Freedom is always freedom from some kind of barrier. And the context might indicate that certain barriers are relevant or not relevant. It's also freedom to do some things instead of other things. So I might be free to use one car or another car if my wife tells me that I can use her car but if she says, no, you can't use my car, then I'm only free to use my own car. I can't use hers because she didn't give me permission. Or, or a prisoner in, in a jail cell is not free to leave their cell, but they are free to go from one corner of the cell to the other corner to sit down or stand up. And then if they are let out of their cell so that they can go into the prison yard, they're free to move around in their cell or to go out in the yard and move around in the yard, but they're still not free to go outside the prison instead of inside the prison. And if they're released from prison and put on house arrest, they're free to move around in their house. They don't have to go to prison, but they're not free to leave their house. Or maybe if they're on bail, out on bail, they can they have to stay in the city, or if they don't have a passport, they can't leave the country. But different barriers put different restrictions on the range or scope of activities that a person is able to do. So freedom is freedom from the different kinds of barriers to do certain things as opposed to other things. Now, that's the general theory. I'm going to focus on a pretty simple contrast, simply two types of freedom from, because I think these are uh, the types of freedom that are relevant to the debate about free will that this whole conference has been about. One is freedom from causation, and the other is freedom from constraint. So let me give you some examples. Here are examples of things that are both causes and also constraints. So if you are caused in one of these ways and constrained by that cause, then you do not have freedom from constraint or causation. You don't have either kind of freedom. If I push you and you fall down, 
if I trip you, or as I just said, if you're in jail, the cell bars physically prevent the person from leaving the cell, okay? There can also be other people uh, who don't trip you or push you, but they coerce you. If you do that, I'm gonna kill you. Give me your money or I will take your life. Coercion. If I then hand over my money, I didn't hand it over freely. Or if you defraud me, you trick me into believing something that's false, uh, as in some of the examples before. There can be internal constraints, such as mental illnesses, including compulsions, phobias, and delusions. But there can also just be mistakes. You know, I am constrained from doing what I want to do because I don't know certain facts. Like I don't know where my car keys are. Then I'm not able to drive the car. But look, they're sitting in the drawer right next to me. So physically, I could open the drawer and get the keys out. But the fact that I'm ignorant, that I don't know where they are, constrains me and prevents me from doing what I want. And there can be norms that constrain me as well. I might tell you, I'm sorry. Claire, I know I'd like to go to the movie with you, but I can't go to the movie with you because I've got to stay home and take care of my kids. Morality makes me unable to do what I want, namely to go with, to the movie. Uh, I'm constrained. Rationality also in other cases. I won't bother with the example of that, um, but you can imagine that sometimes one option is just irrational and you go, well, I can't pick the other one. That would be stupid. That would be contrary to the norms of rationality, okay? The tricky ones are acts that are caused, but are not constrained. So one example of that is random picking. Suppose that there are two cans of soup on a shelf in my home or maybe in a grocery store. And I pick the can to the right, okay? Um, because I'm right-handed to my right. Okay, uh, then there's a cause of why I picked that can. It was more convenient or uh, my brain led me to attra attract, be more attracted to that one to the right. There was some cause, it wasn't uh, undetermined, uh, it um, but uh, I'm not constrained. Sure, I could have gotten the other can. I was perfectly able. If I had wanted to, I would have. And I had nothing that kept me from wanting the other can instead of that one. Another example is watching a movie just because you want to. And at this point, Claire is going to help me um, by reading the father following dialogue or parts of it uh, to illustrate this example. Where are you? Claire, you promised to drive me to the airport, but you never showed up and I missed my flight. You didn't even say you're sorry. Why did you let me down? Don't be angry with me. I watched a movie instead. You watched a movie? What kind of excuse is that? It's the newest kind, a neural excuse. I really wanted to watch a movie and my desires are, are lodged in my brain. So my brain made me do it. Of course your brain made me do it. It wasn't your foot. Your desires are located in your brain. So your brain made you do it. So what? What matters is which part of your brain made you do it. What made you do it was activity in your brain that constitutes your desires. So when you say, my brain made me do it in this case, it's, that's just a misleading way of saying that you did it because you wanted to. That's no excuse. But given all of my desires and beliefs, I would act in the same way every time in the circumstances. Sure you would, but why? Only because your brain is set up so that you care more about the movie than you care about me. How is that supposed to make me any less angry? 
your brain doesn't care about me or you don't care about me. Either way, you treated me like dirt. I'm sorry. See, it's it's really hard sometimes to get to get your collaborators to say they're sorry. But if you if you trick them like this, then they'll say it. OK, so the point is I could have been completely caused. I mean, she could have been completely caused to do the things that she did caused by her desires and beliefs and so on. But that kind of cause does not operate as a constraint. She still could have done it. Uh, and it doesn't operate as an excuse. So it doesn't reduce responsibility. Okay. Now, how does this contrastivism and this distinction between causes and constraints affect that basic challenge that we had at the beginning? The argument against responsibility, at least, you know, which was part of the original challenge that reached the subconclusion six that denied responsibility, I claim equivocates between these two contra contrasts with freedom, okay? So the premises in the argument that enabled uh, the argument to reach conclusion six, the crucial ones were any act, any agent whose act is determined is not free. And any agent who is not free is not responsible. And what I'm saying is we gotta ask what they mean by free. They might mean freedom from causation. Well, look, then, sure, any agent whose act is determined is not free from causation. They're caused by the things that determine their action. But on that understanding of freedom, premise five turns out to be false. Any agent who is not free is not responsible. Wait, any agent who's not free from causation is not responsible. That means Claire was not responsible for watching the movie and letting me down, so I missed my airplane. What about freedom from constraint? Well, freedom from constraint makes premise five true because if you're not free from constraint, then you are not responsible because if you're not free from constraint, you have an excuse. But then premise two is not true. Any agent whose act is determined is not free from constraint. Well, that's just not true unless all determinism is a constraint. But again, the dialogue suggested that's not the case. So either way, either if we take free to mean free from causation, or if we take free to mean free from constraint, either way, that basic argument against responsibility fails. And we can even put it on the same diagram. It's getting way too complex now, and there are too many words on the screen. The new parts are the bottom lines that uh, the contrastive version of partial compatibilism accepts premise two for freedom from causation, but denies it for freedom from constraint. And it accepts conclusion four for freedom from causation, but denies it for freedom from constraint. And it denies premise five for freedom from causation, but accepts it for freedom from constraint. Now that's really a complicated position. So I'm gonna say it a different way, just to make sure that we understand it. We can think of contrastive partial compatibilism and the people who hold it as trying to get the best of both worlds, just like Hannah Montana and Miley Cyrus, okay? Contrastive partial compatibilists agree with old fashioned compatibilists about freedom from constraint, but not about freedom from causation. They agree with incompatibilists, like libertarians and hard determinists. They agree with them about freedom from causation, but they don't agree with them about freedom from constraint. And what about semi-compatibilists like John Fisher? They agree with them or partial compatibilism that's not contrastive, that version. They agree in denying premise five if that premise is about freedom from causation, but not if it's about freedom from constraint. Now, that's a really complicated view. And so I wanna stop again 
it's the, it's the view that I hold uh, and that I think my co-authors hold, uh, at least they're willing to uh, endorse these slides. Uh, and so I wanna stop and see if anybody has any questions about uh, that contrastivism part of the talk. And I'll just go back to this slide. Yeah, there we go. This slide. So um, are there any questions about what the view is or what it means or whether it's plausible in light of the dialogue or how we distinguish constraints from causes or any of that? No? Hi, Walter. My question will be, uh... I mean, constraints can have multiple levels. Um, Absolutely. What, uh, what kind of level will be supposed um, to make a difference? I mean, what kind of, you know, a level of, I don't know, pressure that, I mean, it's, you're not embedded causally, but you have a lot of constraints. It, it, to, I mean, to which extent I, you have like a threshold here, for example. So I think one thing we have to ask is which one makes a difference or matters to what? To freedom or to responsibility? Right? My question to responsibility. Okay. So then we ask which of these removes responsibility? If I push you and you fall on somebody, are you responsible? No. No, no, no. That's why you're constrained. That's why counselors are constrained. If I trip you when you fall on somebody, same thing. If you missed your, your daughter's birthday party because you were in jail behind cell bars, well, don't make it, you're kidnapped. And so you're, I don't want it to be cell bar because you might say you're responsible for being in jail. Uh, let's say you were kidnapped and you're behind cell bars, then you're not responsible, okay? If you're coerced, your money or your life, and you give away the money that you were going to buy your daughter's birthday present with, are you responsible? I'd say no. Fraud. Somebody defrauds you. They say, yes, um, I'll sell you this box, which is what your daughter wants for a birthday present. Uh, if you give me that money, you give them the money and open the box, and it's something entirely different that your daughter doesn't want, right? So these ones that I'm listing as constraints, are the very kinds of conditions, mental illness, uh, reasonable mistakes, moral restrictions. Those are exactly the kinds of things that remove responsibility. Whereas these other things, right? Picking with identical cans of soup, you know, I don't know. I mean, you're responsible for picking that can of soup. Nobody cares, but you are. Uh, and we've done surveys where people say that that's true. And in the case of Claire, you know, she had to say she was sorry because she was responsible for me missing my flight. So I'm really at a certain point appealing to um, common sense about which kinds of conditions remove responsibility and which don't. That's why it matters to responsibility. Now, we can argue about whether, for example, ignorance, when is a mistake a reasonable mistake? We can argue about that. And then we're arguing about whether that kind of ignorance really is a constraint or not. Um, but it's supposed to line up with your intuitions about which types of causes remove responsibility and which don't. Great, Santiago has another question. Please, Santiago, feel free to jump in. I'm sorry I have so many questions, but I've been waiting to hear this talk from you for a long time, Walter, so. Um... I'm not sorry at all, Santiago. Okay, so you started with this, and this is something that's, I'm, I'm generally asking a question here. It's not, it's not a trick question. Is the two senses of freedom, the, the initial ones, freedom from and freedom to? And you immediately went to saying that, you know, the freedom that we care about in this sort of debates is freedom from. Mm. But, it, uh, but I, wa I want to know, you know, why you say that because one way of interpreting the debate 
is, well, we're interested in this kind of freedom to do something other than what than the blameworthy thing that you did. Uh, so it's freedom to do one thing instead of another. And that's the core sense of freedom, not freedom from, that comes later when you start talking about causation and determinism and things like that. So uh, I agree that we have you have to be free to do one thing as opposed to another. That's part of the notion of freedom. But you also have to analyze any claim in terms of freedom from. Those are not two different things. And every time somebody says, am I free to do this? Uh, then um, you have to ask, free to do what? as opposed to, and free from what, right? So for example, if you go into a theater and you say, uh, is this seat free? Am I free to sit in this seat? Uh, you say, well, uh, you're not free to sit in it. Uh, you're free to sit in it as opposed to stand up, but you're not free from the restriction that that seat is taken. Right? Uh, or am I free to sit? Suppose I just point to the chair and say, am I free to sit? You say, yeah, you're free to sit, but not there. You're free to sit this other place. And you're free from any restriction to sit in the other place, but you're not free from a reservation to sit here. So I think whenever somebody says, is something free, you have to ask, am I free? Is the coffee free? Well, you might be free to take a cup of coffee without charge, but you can't just take the whole vat of coffee and walk out the front door, right? So you have to analyze each use of the term freedom in both of these, with both of these variables, free from what and free to do what, as opposed to what else. That's my claim about how you have to analyze freedom to get precise. Does that help? Good. I see you. I see him nodding. I don't know if other people can see him nodding, but any other questions or should I go on? There's, there's no questions in the Q and A too. So feel free to go on. Okay. So what I've been doing so far is philosophy. Uh, and now I'm going to turn to the psychology part, because I can argue for this view. Uh, and the question is, does anybody believe me? Uh, do other people think this way? Or am I just off in my philosophical ivory tower and, with no connection to the real world? So uh, this is where Claire and Paul and John have been so helpful. Uh, in doing these studies that I'm now going to tell you about. Because the question is, okay, what do the folk mean by free? Do they mean free from constraint or do they mean free from causation or free from determination? Do they all mean the same thing? No, of course they don't. I put folk music up there because folk music in the US is all kinds of things. And folk music in the U.S. is different from folk music in Brazil. The folk don't all think alike. So we want to distinguish four different notions of freedom, freedom from different things, and then ask, which do people use in which circumstances? Freedom from determination is simply present when the act is not determined. To say you're free from it is to say it's not the case. It's not determined. Okay? So you're you have freedom from determination when your act is not determined. You have freedom from causation when your act is not caused. Notice they're all negative. Freedom is excluding something. That's what freedom from means. So you're free from causation when your act is not caused by anything. And libertarians say you are free from causation. Freedom from inevitability. Um, Santiago asked about this. When the act is not inevitable, you can do otherwise, right? So it's not freedom from inevitability. Uh, I'm sorry, you are free from inevitability when you can do otherwise, and you're not free from inevitability when you cannot do otherwise. 
okay? And we're also going to talk about freedom from constraint, which we just explained. That happens when the argument, when the agent's not constrained, that is not prevented from doing what they really want to do uh, and or prevented from responding to reasons, however you want to spell that out. I don't think the particular ways of spelling that out are going to uh, matter to um, the experiments we do and the position I take. Okay. Now, remember, my claim is, do all agents mean the same? No. Different ones mean different things, okay? In different circumstances. So we've got four hypotheses. The first hypothesis is about people who affirm that an agent acts freely, who say, yes, this agent is free. Which agent? Well, an agent in a scenario where it's clear that the act is determined. And I wanna, we wanna make two claims about that agent. Uh, they are thinking about freedom from constraint when they say that, yes, the agent acted freely, even though they were determined. And they're not thinking about freedom from determination, okay? But now let's switch to a different group of people, people who deny that the agent acts freely in the scenario, right? And this is the same scenario, the agent is determined, okay? Um, and our claim about them is they are thinking about freedom from determination. They're not thinking about freedom from constraint, unlike the people who affirm. So the people who affirm freedom and deny freedom are actually thinking about different kinds of freedom. But that's only in a, in a scenario where there's determination. What about a scenario where the agent cannot do otherwise? Uh, I'll give you the example in a second, but it's the counterfactual intervener scenario. And the claim is those people who say that the person is free, even though they can't do otherwise, are mostly thinking about freedom from constraint. They're not thinking about freedom from inevitability. Okay. And the other people on the same, thinking about the same scenario, but they deny that the agent acts freely because some of them do. Okay. And they're mostly thinking about freedom from inevitability and they're not thinking about freedom from constraint. So which kind of freedom you're thinking about depends on which scenario you're thinking about and what kind of person you are, whether you know you think one is more important than the other, and so you're thinking in those terms. Different people will do it different ways, okay? And just to get the scenario straight, this is a long slide, but basically the first paragraph, this is, these are classic scenarios from uh, Nichols and Nob, uh, Ivar Hanikinen, uh, or Hanikinen, I forget how to pronounce the name, uh, is uh, used these in his study, which I'll mention later as well, and we got them from him. Uh, and so um, the first paragraph simply just explains what determinism is. Everything's completely brought about by whatever happened before it. So if you know John decides to have vegetable soup, then he'll do exactly the same way thing if everything in the universe up until then is the same. And in this universe, a man named Bill becomes attracted to his secretary. This is the second paragraph. And he decides that the only way to be with her is to kill his wife and three children. So before he leaves on a business trip, he sets up a bomb that destroys his house and kills his family while he is away. Now that's the determined scenario. We also had a not determined scenario that started differently. Imagine an alternative universe where human decisions are not completely brought about by whatever happened before them, okay? In this universe, a man named Bill did, did exactly what it said in the second paragraph of the determined scenario, exactly the same words. That's the D and ND scenarios, determined and not determined. The other set of scenarios are the inevitability scenarios, which involve a counterfactual intervener who's a mad scientist. That's why I have the picture in the upper right. Uh, the mad scientist uh, puts a chip in a person's brain, Martin's brain, 
And the chip it operates so that if Martin decides not to kill his friend, Adam, then the chip will fire and make Martin kill his friend, Adam. But if Martin decides to kill Adam on his own, the chip doesn't do anything. So what happens is Martin decides to kill Adam on his own and the scientists, you know, thus, uh, and so the, so the scientists never have to activate the chip. The chip never becomes active. But it's still true that Martin could not have done otherwise, because if he had decided not to kill Adam, he would have ended up killing Adam anyway. This is an old kind of example that I think dates back at least to Harry Frankfurt, but I think there were examples before that as well. And then we want to pair that with a no counterfactual intervener, exactly this, you know, a, a, a different universe. There are no scientists who put a chip in Martin's brain, right? And so he is able to avoid killing Adam. If he wants to kill Adam, he will. If he doesn't, if he decides not to, he won't. Okay. So in the first case, the act is inevitable. If Martin tries to avoid it, he'll do it anyway. In the second scenario, it's not inevitable uh, because if Martin decides not to do it, he won't do it, okay? So now, how do we figure out what kind of freedom people are thinking about in these scenarios? Well, we have to ask them a bunch of questions. You can't just give them the scenario and say, hey, what do you think? And, you know, or was he free? You have to ask a bunch of difficult questions. First, we asked about free action, just to stick to the determined scenario, which I'll focus on mostly. Did Bill act freely when he killed his family? Did Bill act of his own free will when he killed his family? Was Bill able to avoid killing his family? Was Bill morally responsible for killing his family? So we asked him all four questions and counterbalanced it. But then, for the people who said, yes, Bill acted freely, we asked another set of questions. We asked, well, if Bill's desire to kill his family caused him to kill his family, then Bill did not act freely when he killed his family. Do you agree? Yes or no? Now notice that if you believe that freedom, the important kind of freedom is freedom from causation, you should say, uh, yeah, I agree. If it caused him, he did not act freely because he was caused. But if you think, if you're thinking about freedom from constraint, you should say no, because even though his desire killed him, he still acted freely from constraint because the desire is not a constraint. And we did this with an external temptation, like the beauty of the secretary. We asked about normal brain activity that caused him to do it. That's the third question here. But we also added two that are constraints. The blue ones are mere causes that are not constraints. And the pink ones are causes that are constraints, mental illness. If Bill had a severe mental illness that caused him to kill his family, then he didn't act freely. If Bill had powerful enemies who threatened him, right, and the threat caused him to kill his family, then he didn't act freely. We asked all these questions because what these questions do is they tell you what the particular participant is thinking about in that scenario. So here's the overall design. First, we divided them. Half of them got the, the D scenario, the determined scenario. Half of them got CI. But after it, each of them were asked the first four questions, the free action, free will, avoidable questions, the one on the top here. And then if they said that Bill was free, we gave them the other five questions, the desire, temptation, brain, mental illness. But if they said, no, he was not free, then we asked, why not? And sure enough, in the Bill case, I think 98 out of 99 said it was because of determinism. And in the Martin case, 
Uh, I don't remember the exact number. I don't know, Claire, do you remember the number? It was over 90 anyway, wasn't it? It was very similar. Um, yeah, it was very similar. similar. Like 95, 96. Yeah. Uh, so we had very few people in the lower right and we asked them, well, if it wasn't determinism, then what was it? And we got nonsense basically. Uh, but for the ones who said, yes, it was determinism. So then we said, well, now what about desire, temptation, brain? After giving them the non-deterministic scenario. So we gave them a different scenario where it was not determined. And then we asked them about this, okay? So uh, what are the results? Results are they did not distinguish free action from free will, right? I mean, you're talking about very high correlations. They basically gave pretty much the same answer. So they're not distinguishing free action from free will. Al Mealy, and when I told him these results said, yeah, that's great. That supports my theory. So 17%, um, now what about freedom and responsibility though? 17% ascribed responsibility without freedom. And that might seem like a really low number, but let's dig behind that a little and think about it. Of the people who denied that Bill acted freely, half of them ascribed responsibility despite denying free action. And of course, the ones who did not deny that he acted freely, who said that he did act freely, they couldn't say that he had responsibility without freedom because they said he had freedom. So the only ones that could have of the group who were in a position where they could have said he was responsible without being free, half of them said he was. Okay. Uh, now, what about free from what? What are they thinking about? Well, only 2% agreed with all five conditional statements about causes. Remember, every one of those statements said caused by desire caused by the secretary's beauty, caused by the neural activity, caused by severe mental illness, caused by the coercive powerful enemy, the threat. Every one of those says he was caused. But if you believe, if you're thinking about freedom from causation, you should deny them all. But only, I'm sorry, you should agree with, you should accept them all, agree with them all. Uh, but only 2% agreed with all five. And it was something like, for less than 5% that said, that agreed with four out of five. So they're not thinking about freedom from causation. What about our hypothesis one? Remember that was about the deterministic scenario and what people were thinking about um, when they uh, ascribed freedom and said that Bill was free in the deterministic scenario. Well, our results supported the first part. Most people who said that he acted freely saw mental illness and coercion as removing freedom, right? So they, sorry, I'm trying to go back and forth here. So they agreed to mental illness and coercion here, but they did not agree to the other three. So that means they're thinking of freedom from constraint and they're not thinking of freedom from causation. Uh, now, they also could not be thinking about freedom from determination because we beat them over the head and said, this scenario is deterministic and they said, Bill's free. So they can't be thinking of freedom from determination. So overall, the first hypothesis is supported. Now, the positive part of the second hypothesis was also supported. That was about the people who denied that Bill acted freely, okay? So they say Bill was not free in this deterministic universe. And remember 98 out of 99 said that was because he was determined. So they were thinking of freedom from determinism. But our hypothesis too said they were not thinking about freedom from constraint, okay? That was not supported. It was also not refuted, but it was not supported by our evidence. We'll come back to this in, in more detail to say why it's not refuted. But most people who denied that Bill acted freely uh, and then uh, read 
the non-deterministic scenario where he's not determined anymore, then they said mental illness and coercion remove freedom, but desire, temptation, and brain activity do not. So they seem to be thinking about freedom from constraint. So both parts of hypothesis one, but only the positive part of hypothesis two, not the negative part. And we got similar results for H3 and H4 for hypothesis three and four about the counterfactual intervener, but I won't go uh, through those now, okay? I'll get your question in just a second, Gabriel. I've got another slide uh, coming up. Uh, and then we'll draw conclusions and then I'll take questions. So do they really distinguish desire, temptation, and brain that is causes that are not constraints from causes that are constraints like mental illness and coercion? Uh, to do that, Claire did a principal components analysis. And this is why I love working with Claire. She can explain it to you better than I can. So Claire, tell them what this slide means. Um, so I uh, conducted a principal component analysis, which um, categorizes responses based off of uh, relationships within the responses. So um, since there were five different options, um, some people tended to answer certain questions um, the same way they answered other questions. And based off of that, you can find patterns within the way people answered and see how um, the, uh, which reveals something that, that, that is underneath, a, a component that is connecting the responses to these answers statistically. Um, and so these numbers, Walter, can you use your cursor to show which numbers I'm talking about, the 0.77? Yes. So these numbers are the correlation of the response to the um, implicit uh, unifying variable. So um, it, it, we, in, we refer to it as, as loading onto a factor. So people's responses to desire, temptation, and brain um, all correlated by 0.7x percent to, to a singular underlying variable. Right, to so um, this latent variable one up here, yeah. Um, and, and then mental illness and coercion um, loaded onto variable two, which um, indicates that people responded to these questions distinctly across population response. So I would only add a couple of things, namely one, desire, temptation, and brain, their answers did not load on factor two at all. And mental illness and coercion did not load on latent variable one at all. And of course we picked these because these three are the ones that are causes but not constraints. And these two are the ones that are constraints as well as causes. The other thing I would add is that this relationship held for all four scenarios, determined, not determined, counterfactual intervener, no counterfactual intervener. Across the board, all of them seem to be grouping the constraints separately from the causes uh, that are not constrained and explained a large part of the, this model explained a large part of the variance uh, in our data, okay? So our conclusions, and then I'll get your question, Gabriel. Uh, participants did not distinguish freedom from free action from free will. They did distinguish free action from responsibility and did not take responsibility to require free action. They did not think about freedom from causation. They, those who affirmed freedom were thinking about freedom from constraint. The ones who uh, affirmed freedom were not thinking about freedom from determination or causation or inevitability. Those who denied freedom were thinking about freedom from determination in one scenario, inevitability in the other. But the big question that remains and that our next study is going to address is they, we did not settle this one. Participants who denied freedom uh, were thinking about freedom from constraint, at least afterwards while they were reading the non-deterministic scenario. Okay. 
you've been very patient, Gabriel. Thank you. No problem. No, no, we've got a whole nother study. Don't clap. Oh, great, hands. great. I was just, yeah. just clapping hands for oh, okay. uh, this part of the talk. My question is very specific. It's more of a curiosity. Um, how the folk respond to the scenario when you have inevitability, but the chip is not fired? I was really curious about this case. We have inevitability, but the evil scientist does not fire the chip. No. So when the, oh, so that's the CI scenario. CI scenario. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that's just so people will keep straight. That's the top scenario here. Okay. Right. That's the one you're asking about. Yeah, exactly. And there, when they said that Martin was free anyway, which the majority of them said, I forget the exact percentage. Claire probably has it. Uh, but they uh, showed signs when they were given uh, these questions at the bottom, they showed that they were thinking about freedom from uh, constraint and not constraint. and not freedom from inevitability. Claire, do you remember how many people in this scenario, what percentage uh, said that Martin was free? Um, I'm pulling it up now, but I actually believe that more people said that Martin was free then they said that Bill was free. Okay. I hope the translator is not going crazy. She's been so great all week. I hate to drive her crazy by going through my slides so quickly, but go ahead. Uh, so Gabriel, that was it, that answered your question? Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was I was thinking of something really specific because inevitability in the Brazilian law somehow uh, uh, blocks any sort of legal liability. And but I was I mean the way the the scenario was constructed was uh, very intelligent because somehow the the, the, the causal factor is still the, the guy that fires the gun or whatever, not the scientists. Right, right. That's oh. the, the, it was very ingenious scenario, Frankfurt. I think Harry Frankfurt was the first, but Locke actually had yeah. another similar case, John Locke back in the 17th century. Um, but I think when the lawyers talk about inevitability, they actually they use something them. else. Part of the yeah. whole point of my talk is you can't use words like free and inevitable without asking what you mean by it. Yeah. Renata. So Walter, uh, it's, it's, it's very, very interesting all of this. Uh, uh, I have been thinking a lot about this since you, 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 I, I first saw this, 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 some of his numbers in the neurophilosophy of free will uh, you did with John, John Dylan Hanks. Uh, one question I, I, I keep asking, the, the number, the 47%, that really is a very uh, interesting number. The ones that do ascribe responsibility without... You mean uh, th th these numbers here? Yeah, uh, I, I think it's, it's before that. It's the, the, the number of people that did say that he was responsible even though he wasn't free. Ah. Yeah, so uh, my question to you is, uh, from the, the beginning of your talk, I imagined a lot of Kantian uh, colleagues, friends screaming from the, the top of their lungs. Uh, and I, I would like to ask you, is it a philosophical bias that we have, this strong link be between free will and responsibility? And uh, we as philosophers start from this presupposition uh, uh, that, you know, art implies can, and this is not something that lay people share. And this would be like one of the same uh, examples that Thomas was talking before. We do a lot of presuppositions and then we go to experimental philosophy and we don't find it because we're so used to talking in philosophical terms with philosophical uh, frames that we, we, we miss the argument that lay people, yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. I would add 
uh, something within philosophy uh, is that metaphysicians miss it. Because when you think about responsibility from the point of view of ethics or philosophy of law, then you realize that responsibility is a social construct that we ascribe responsibility when people are negligent and when they make mistakes and, and I'm, that they shouldn't be making because a reasonable person would not have made that mistake. And wait a minute, that doesn't have anything to do with freedom, right? Uh, responsibility depends on a lot of factors, like how difficult something was. If it was extremely difficult, you're still free to do it. You're just not going to succeed very often. And if it's difficult enough, you're not going to be responsible. Uh, and so responsibility is really a very different kind of notion uh, than freedom is, uh, as I see it. But when people start doing the metaphysics of free will, they forget about all of those practical considerations and the way the notion of responsibility is used in morality and the law. And that's right. part of Sorry. why people conflate the two. So, yeah, yeah, that's what I would uh, uh, follow. Do, would you ascribe to that notion then that responsibility is a, a, a social construct? And, and uh, So uh, in, in a certain sense, we have to talk for a little while about what you mean by social construct, but I do think it's a social notion that's going to be dependent partly on how people around you behave. Uh, and what people expect of you and what you know they expect of you. So yeah, I would say it's an interpersonal notion whereas freedom is more intrapersonal and freedom is more metaphysical and responsibility is more normative. And if you start thinking about how different these are from each other, you shouldn't be so surprised that you can get responsibility without freedom. Thank you very much, Walter. You cleared a lot of, a lot of things. Are there any questions from the audience that I should answer before I move on? Wait, I see your mouth moving, uh, Gabriel, but not, you're muted. Uh, there's a question for Professor Nidamar. Uh, many thanks, Walter, if I may, uh, for the brilliant talk. Find your takes on freedom. I find your takes on freedom, its properties and nuances extremely convincing. Now, does this opposing of freedom from constraint to both freedom from causation and freedom for determination allow for anything like degrees of freedom of will, volition or choice in terms of decision making processes? I mean, I totally agree that, you know, if I were to add even more you know, things I would say, how free, and there'd be degrees of freedom from causation, free freedom, well, at least freedom from um, constraint. But notice, you're either determined or you're not. And yeah. it's not going to be a question of partly determined. And so determinism is a notion that does not come in degrees. You either are determined or not. Uh, whereas, and I'm not sure about causation because there's probabilistic causation that might come in degrees. Constraint definitely comes in degrees, right? Inevitability, I'm not sure whether that come in degrees. It might mean, depend on exactly what you mean by it. Uh, but does freedom come in degrees? I'm going to answer you the way I answer many people. Which kind of freedom are you talking about? Freedom from constraint, yes. Freedom from determinism, no. Freedom from causation and inevitability, I'm not sure. We got to ask what you mean. Marco Aurelio, feel free to jump in. Uh, I just want to know if uh, you have any similar experiment uh, done with uh, other folks. As you said, folks differ, right? And uh, mainly in different languages because the way the questions are phrased, they seem to be very important. I mean. A lot of the examples here, they are hardly translatable to Portuguese, for instance, the way we use the word free, for instance. And I, I just wonder if you have it done in, with other folks in other languages or not. So, you know, you're, you know on the one hand, I, um, I'm sad at your question because you ruined my last slide, which is, I wish we could have other people. Uh, 
you know, you're absolutely right. Uh, but on the other hand, I'm happy because it gives me to say now what I'm going to say at the end, which is Brazilians, please work with me. Uh, and I want to, I have collaborators in uh, Brazil and China, uh, Germany, John Dylan Haynes can do it in German. Uh, and I hope, but I haven't done it yet. I, it's a very important question and it'll be interesting to see. I wouldn't be surprised if different people around the world who speak different languages and grew up in different cultures might be using different notions, but we'll never figure out which notion they're using unless we ask them more questions than just, is the person free? You've got to ask them detailed questions like, would they be free under these other circumstances? That's how you figure out what they're really thinking. So it's a methodological point that we still have to translate into other languages. So thank you for your question. Okay. Where do we sign? If, if I may, uh, I, I, it, it, for example, let, let us say you would just get nouns. You always use the word freedom. What if I change freedom, if, uh, if I exchange freedom for liberty, it will be a mess, isn't it? Uh, and it's an interesting question. We haven't asked that question, but notice that we actually, I, I refer to freedom using the noun version, but the actual questions ask, did Bill act freely using an adverb? As an adverb, yeah. Act of his own free will. Now that was a noun. Was he able to act verb? Was he morally responsible adjective? So uh, we don't use terms like inevitability, responsibility. Uh, we tried to use more common English phrases. There still might be problems translated. Though. OK, um, shall I move on or other questions? OK, move on. Feel free to, to follow. OK, uh, so as I said, this last hypothesis, the claim that people who deny freedom uh, are not thinking about freedom from constraint, that was the hypothesis. But it looked like they were. So how could that happen? Um, most of them looked like they were thinking about freedom from constraint. But notice that they thought that later. Let's, let me just go back to the design. Sorry to, oh, there we go. The design was that we're now asking people down here these questions. The people who denied freedom go over to this side, and then they get asked these five questions later when they're talking about the non-deterministic scenario, okay? So they're, they're, these people are asking these questions after getting just the deterministic scenario. These people are asked these questions after the non-deterministic scenario. And we thought, that was stupid. Why do we do that? <laughs> uh, because now there are these two interpretations. One interpretation is, hey, when they first got the deterministic scenario, they were thinking, they were not thinking about freedom from constraint, but later when they got the non-deterministic scenario, they were, okay? But there's another interpretation. This was great because my collaborator, Paul Rarin, thought this was the one that was right, and I thought the top one was right. Um, if only grad students knew that their professor was always right, but that's not always really true. So uh, they're always right. <laughs> thank you, Claire. Uh, and so uh, the bypassing interpretation says actually they were thinking about freedom from constraint all along, and here was their reasoning in the deterministic scenario: if someone's actions are determined, then they're determined by purely physical causes electrical impulse and chemical transfers in the brain, okay? Their desires and decisions, their mental life, their self has nothing to do with it. The same thing's gonna happen anyway. That's why it's determined. So it's not really caused by their desires or decisions. And if it's not caused by their desires or decisions, then they're not doing what they wanna do because they wanna do it. So it turns out they are constrained. 
And determinism on this bypassing view guarantees that their acts are constrained. Eddie Namius believes that most people uh, who are, uh, that many people think this way and that this explains some patterns in the data. Eddie Namius is the one that's well known for uh, pressing this bypassing interpretation. Notice that the contextual interpretation is compatible with the second part of the second hypothesis, but the bypassing is not. So if we really want to find out whether that whether that hypothesis is true, we have to test the bypassing interpretation. And that's what we tried to do in our second experiment. Okay, uh, study two, you like the double-headed snake? Clara doesn't. <laughs> okay, so participants, uh, same recruitment, same, we, we did all kinds of exclusions to make sure they understood the, the thing and had to kick out quite a few people, but ended up with 311. Uh, in this design, each participant read and responded to questions about both scenarios, but we randomized the order, okay? Uh, the scenarios, we dropped the counterfactual intervener um, and just used the determined and not determined scenario. Because we were doing it twice, we had to, um, we had to change the names. So we varied the names to help them keep straight which, which was which. And also because they might get the non-determined scenario first, we had to explain uh, at the beginning of the non-determined scenario exactly what determinism was because previously that had been in the, the D scenario. And we asked these questions. We dropped the constraint scenarios. We wanted to ask these questions instead. Um, and for technical reasons, we changed to negative 100 to positive 100 instead of simply yes, no. Uh, we asked, did the agent, remember the name changed, did the agent act freely when he killed his family? Was he morally responsible when he killed his family? Do you agree that he was? He was able to avoid killing his family, do you agree? Uh, do you desire to be with this second? Did the desire cause him, right? Remember last time we asked if it caused him, would he be free? Now we want to make sure they want to claim that it did, did cause it, right? Because um, we want to know whether they're thinking in terms of bypassing. Did the decision, another mental state, but different from desire, did the decision cause him to kill his family? Okay. And did neural activity cause him to kill his family? Okay, somewhat different questions from the first study. And the results, uh, this first one's just a bunch of numbers. You don't have to worry much about them. The take home is simply the subjects uh, in this study ascribe more freedom in the non-deterministic scenario than in the deterministic scenario, as you would expect. Uh, that when we dichotomize the ratings, so the people who went above zero as opposed to zero or below uh, for those questions. They didn't differ significantly from the responses in study one. They were you know, giving us pretty much the same answers in a separate sample, still all from the US. And what we wanted to look at was mediation. Um, and the reason we wanted to look at mediation is that the bypassing scenario says, hey, you see determinism, that makes you think that their mental states are not causing their actions. It bypasses their mental states like their desires and decisions. And that's why you think they're not responsible. Okay, I'm sorry, that's why you think they're not free. We're talking about freedom here, okay? So you would expect if mediation is true, the desire would mediate the relationship between determinism and freedom in the whole sample. It did not. You would think that decision, another mental state, would mediate the relationship between determinism and freedom in the whole sample. Because the whole point of bypassing is that determinism would make you think the decision didn't have any effect. But that was a weak, very weak mediation. And neither of them mediated that relation in the subsample 
of 108 people who denied freedom. And the bypassing interpretation says people who deny freedom in the, in the determinist scenario deny it because they think determinism means that the desire and decision don't matter to the action. Well, none of that mediation occurred. Uh, and only 26% of the subsample who denied freedom, so would be 28 probably out of 108, also did not agree with both the desire and decision uh, claims, okay? So uh, they were not denying the desire and decision had causal effects on the action, even though uh, they were um, in the deterministic scenario and they denied freedom in that scenario. So that's not why they're doing it. That speaks against the bypassing interpretation. For freedom, what about responsibility? Because it might mediate the relation between determinism and responsibility, even if it does not mediate it between determinism and freedom. So uh, people did ascribe less responsibility in the deterministic than in the non-deterministic, but desire did not mediate the relation. Decision did, at least moderately, mediate the relation, okay? So thinking that decision uh, is bypassed in a deterministic universe might help to explain why these participants ascribe less responsibility in D, the deterministic universe, than they did in ND, the indeterministic universe. So might explain, you know, significant part of it uh, for responsibility, not freedom. Again, this separates freedom from responsibility, so that's interesting to us. What does explain that? Inevitability. Inevitability mediated the relation between determinism and freedom, and it did it moderately in the whole sample, but it was pretty weak in the subsample uh, of 108 who denied freedom, okay? But it strongly mediated the relation between determinism and responsibility. So it looks like what's going on is when people think of a deterministic scenario, they think the person's not able to do otherwise, and that's why they're not responsible. They're not thinking the person's determined. Uh, determinism makes the, their, their desires and decisions irrelevant. They're thinking determinism makes them unable to do otherwise, and that's why they gave lower ratings of responsibility. That seems to be the explanation. So our conclusions are that uh, the bypassing interpretation claims makes claims that uh, that uh, did not hold up. It claims that the participants who denied freedom assumed that determinism implies bypassing, and bypassing implies constraint. So they were really thinking about freedom from constraint. But if that were right, then they should deny both desire and decision, and they don't. And if that were right, then agreement with desire and decision should mediate the relation between determinism and freedom. But that was weak. Uh, it did show something about responsibility, but inevitability explained more of the variance uh, and the relation was stronger. Okay. Um, so those results speak against the bypassing interpretation. If there's no better alternative, then I say that supports the contextual interpretation. And what it suggests is that people, the common folk, actually think in line with contrastive partial compatibilism, because what they're showing is exactly the pattern of responses that would be predicted uh, by uh, that view that I outlined in the first half of the talk. Um, now, of course, there are limitations in the first one has already been mentioned. It's a, what a weird study, namely Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic US participants. We've got to test it in other countries, especially Brazil. I would love to work with people to replicate this uh, in Brazil. Um, as uh, Ivar did in 2019. Um, 
Secondly, a subset of our conclusions are based on analyses restricted to participants who denied freedom. Remember that 108? Well, I wish we had more people uh, in those classes. In the counterfactual intervener scenario is even a smaller group. Uh, so future research should seek larger samples to, uh, to confirm uh, that they still hold. Um, it our results were significant you know, in those samples, but it'd be better to have larger samples. Third, both of our scenarios involve murder, right? You're either killing your family or killing your friend Martin. It'd be interesting to see whether they're still going to hold for less extreme wrongdoing or maybe even responsibility for doing something good where you get credit for doing it, not blame for doing it, but credit for doing it. Be interesting to do that. We haven't done that yet. Uh, and also, we should test other ways to ask our questions. This is related to uh, the talk about what is it a noun? Is it an adjective? Instead of, you know, instead of responsible, should we do blame and credit? See if it all holds up. Uh, there are lots of variations that need to be tested. Uh, so all of those are limitations that point to um, future research. Uh, what are the implications? Uh, I did promise I'd talk about this, and there was one question earlier. I think there are implications for our views of how we differ from other animals, um, because some people are going to say humans have more freedom than other animals. Well, what do they mean? They must mean freedom from constraint, because we're no less determined than animals. We're determined just like animals are, but that doesn't mean we are constrained in the way animals are. If they are acting purely out of instinct, whereas we can think about it and, and fight our instincts, uh, then uh, we might be less constrained than other animals. And similarly for computers, computers are determined, but are we less constrained than computers are? I'm talking current computers here, not some AI fiction in decades in the future or centuries in the future. Okay. Determin also, determinism also poses a general threat, uh, poses no general threat to criminal punishment. Why is that? Because justified punishment, like responsibility, all it requires is freedom from constraint. It doesn't require freedom from determinism. It doesn't require freedom from inevitability. It doesn't require all of that stuff, unless inevitability is understood in a way that just makes it equivalent to freedom from constraint. Uh, so. Um, we can understand, you know, one practical implication is that we can understand how the legal system works by making sure that lawyers and judges and juries and witnesses and so on, when they talk about these things in a courtroom, are thinking about freedom from constraint and not freedom from determinism or causation, uh, which is going to apply to every defendant, including Leopold and Loeb in the opening quotation. And finally, philosophers a difficult group to deal with. Uh, they should just stop arguing about whether we humans are or are not free. That's just the wrong question to be asking. You have to specify what contrasts with freedom. Freedom from what to do what. Then some of those arguments are going to be resolved. And if that's true, then they're going to end up being contrastive, partial compatibilists. So like all philosophical talks, I end up by saying that the implication is that everybody should agree with me. So I look forward to your questions to see whether, in fact, you're willing to go that far. Thank you. Radio is what, the first one on the, in the photo chart, Five, very fast. Go for it. Okay. Uh, uh, look, in the initial uh, part of your talk, you had this, uh, uh, I would say, philosophical clarification of the very notion of freedom. And then you, you, you present the, the, this contrast view and, you know, freedom from, freedom to, freedom from constraint, uh, freedom from uh, causation. And all that seems to me to uh, clear up the whole field in such a way that now we can make more precise questions. But that's a philosophical point. And then uh, I agree. most of the 
most of the, the, the problems with this uh, philosophical tradition, the so-called, you know, problem of free will and determinism and all that seems to be just phrased with, you know, bad concepts. So that's just bad philosophy. It's not that, you know, philosophers are not really consulting the folks, but they're just thinking poorly. They're doing bad philosophy. That's it. But, and my question is the following. Uh, suppose you have all the data you want. So now we're going to consult folks from the whole world and we're going to have all the questions that you, you, you want. So now you know how they react to severe blaming cases, to mild blaming cases, to, you know, giving credit to really great deeds or to mild deeds and, you know, all the different folks from everywhere. Uh, I mean, uh, what does it really change uh, concerning the philosophical point we started with? It's pretty much like we are just kind of now tracking how the different folks uh, they go from one sense to another, but actually most of the philosophical problem is going to be solved by the, the job you already done, just by clarifying the concepts and how the folk uh, consulting is going to be of any help. Uh, as a philosopher, I just want to see why I should, you know, keep seeing your research. I mean, I, I, it seems that you, you have done what I need. Uh, yeah, so why do I need those experiments in the second half? And I've got all the great arguments in the first half. Well, I thank you for your... Uh, endorsement of the arguments in the first half. Uh, I think the second half is important for a number of reasons. I always wonder whether philosophers are just making up their own concepts and talking to themselves. Uh, if they, uh, if that's what I were doing in the first half, I would worry that I had lost contact with the general public. So it's important to me as a philosopher to not simply be stipulating a new meaning for the term free that solves philosophical puzzles, but also that aligns with uh, the general public and the way they think about that problem. Okay. Uh, let's and, sorry, but let's suppose also, that folk vary. They vary a lot. So yeah. which which folks are talking about? Well, I mean, I'm talking about the general trend of look. If my views align with the majority of the folk, I'm happy. <laughs> it doesn't have to align with everybody, right? That's asking way too much. Uh, but at least I'm not losing contact. If my views really align only with 10% of the folk, I really think I, you know, I need to rethink my view, whether I'm really dealing with the issue that people out there are interested in. The other side of the coin, which I'll add, is that surprisingly, philosophers are people too. And so the data about the people might actually help us understand why philosophers hold the views that they do, right? Because they grew up talking about freedom and responsibility with their families, and they talked to their students about it, and so on. So if you want to understand why they hold the positions they do, I think the general trend among the public uh, can help us understand that. Okay. But my last point is to go back to your original comment, which is philosophy, the first philosophy part kind of solved the philosophical issue because we get more precise about the concept. I just want to endorse that wholeheartedly and say, it's not just about freedom. It's also about the word knowledge. So contrastivism and epistemology, yeah. It's also about causation, contrastivism about the metaphysics of causation, yeah. It's also about ethics, contrastivism. Is it wrong or right to give $1,000 to a charity when you've got millions? Well, it might be wrong to give $1,000 instead of 10,000, but right to give $1,000 instead of 100. So I think bringing in the contrast will solve a lot of old philosophical puzzles. Freedom is one instance of that pattern. Um, so I wanted to say, yes, the whole project of contrastivism is to make the concepts more precise so we stop arguing with each other in fruitless ways. Santiago, please. Thank you, Walter. Uh, 
So I want to ask a question about the last uh, point that you made. So how this, how the results here and the distinction that you're making track uh, some philosophical discussions and you know philosophical stipulative definitions. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's a question of how you know the stuff that you presented to us today maps into into that sort of thing. So some people in the debate, some free will theorists, just distinguish between source and leeway notions of responsibility uh, of of freedom. So source uh, seems a lot like freedom from constraint. Leeway seems a lot like freedom from determinism. And then you get this interesting pattern of responses so presented with a consequence argument. Um, leeway theories tend to deny freedom. Uh, source theories tend to affirm freedom. With Frankfurt cases, source uh, theories that affirm freedom. And then there are these weird people like Dirk Parabin, who who just like they say, I'm not too persuaded by the consequence argument, um, but I'm more persuaded by this counterfactual intervening scenarios. And they're thinking about inevitability in this you know, particular sense of the term. So I wonder how much you've, you've thought about how this connects with, the, with how the philosophical discussion of, of free will maps uh, into those different positions. So basically, I laid out the truth and you're asking me what's wrong with these other people. Uh, and so uh, I'll mention the two that you mentioned as the consequence argument. I believe the consequence argument depends on an ambiguity that it equivocates in pretty much the same way that I was claiming that uh, the original, what I call the basic challenge equivocates. Uh, when you use the word can, you have to ask, well, if I can't do it, what prevents me? Is it the fact that I was caused? Is it the fact that I was constrained? And you take those modal notions that are used in the consequence argument, and I think they're equivocal uh, in exactly the same way. Now, I didn't include that here because I would have to explain the consequence argument, but, but you understand what I'm talking about. When it comes to uh, Dirk Paraboom, I mean, he's a hard... Uh, incompatibilist uh, because, uh, or a source incompatibilist, uh, because he wants to talk about what the sources are. In a way, I'm sympathetic with what you're saying, that some sources, right, are incompatible with freedom and others are not. So let's go back to here. I said that all of the questions we asked in study one were about causes, but you can just replace that word with sources, mm -hmm. right? Was the source of my action my desire? Was the source of my action my attraction to the secretary? Was the source of my action my brain? Was the source of my action my mental illness? Was the source of that? And so some sources are constraints like mental illness and coercion. Other sources I'm saying are not. Whereas Paraboom says all sources, right? end up being traceable to the external and therefore even these first three remove freedom and responsibility but notice that in the scenarios we said that the person's desire could be traced back to the beginning of the universe that the source was external and it was caused and yet that's not what people said they didn't say you're not free the way paraboom would so they're not going the hard determinist line mm -hmm. They're instead thinking about, they're not thinking about freedom from causation. They're thinking about freedom from particular types of sources, not others. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, I think it does, thanks. Sure. Sinara, please. Thank you very much, Walter. It's just a question about this, um, uh, degrees of uh, freedom that uh, I am with you that uh, if you think about freedom from constraint, yes, you think can't you could think about uh, uh, freedom coming in in degrees. But uh, you said that um, uh, 
you are not sure uh, about if freedom comes in 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 degrees when it's concerned to freedom from inevitability right. yeah and then i would ask you uh, how freedom from <laughs> inevitability could come in degrees because if i'm not free from inevitability i couldn't have done otherwise yeah and i can't see how uh, this could be in degree. I could more or less have done <laughs> otherwise, or I couldn't. Do you understand what I mean? I think that yeah. you either you can't have done otherwise or not. Then I can't see how this could be in degrees. The then this is what I would like to understand in your position. I mean, you said that you're not sure, but I'm saying that, uh, you know, why we're not sure. <laughs> I, I see Claire's hand up. Do you want to answer that question, Claire, or did you have your own? Okay. Um, so, um, let me give you an example to explain. Notice that by inevitability here, what I mean is able to avoid doing the action. Hmm. So let's suppose that I'm playing golf. I'm a golfer, so all my examples are about golf. But I hope that you understand golf well enough to know that part of golf is to putt on the green and to try to make a putt. Now, if I make a putt that's a foot long, that's no big deal. I make really 99.99% .99 of those putts. Most people just give them to me because they think it's obvious you're gonna make it. But if I'm 30 feet away, I'm able to make the putt, but it's a lot harder, okay? So let's suppose that you and I are playing golf together and I miss the putt. Hmm. Well, was I able to avoid missing the putt? That is, was I able to make the putt? Well, if it was a one foot putt, I would say I was more able than if it was a 20 foot putt or a 10 foot putt, but I was still able to make the 10 foot putt, but just a lot less likely. So if you think of ability in terms of how often you succeed in reaching your goal, what's the probability of it? then you can see how the ability to avoid is gonna be something that also comes in degrees. I'm more able to make a one foot putt than I am to make a 10 foot putt, even though I'm able in, to some degree to make either of them. That's the kind of notion of degrees of ability that I had in mind. And, and notice that when you practice golf, what you're trying to do is to get better at making the 10 foot putt to become more able to make the 10 foot putt by increasing the probability that you'll make it. And the same holds for free throws in basketball and penalty kicks in, in soccer or football. Mm -hmm. It holds in all of those cases. That it's going to vary the probabilities. Uh, you're more able when there's a higher probability you'll succeed. That's the kind of notion I had in mind. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The next question I will gonna read is the question of uh, Noel. Oh, good. Hi, Noel. <laughs> now he's 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 taking care of his kids, so he he, he sent me the question by by chat. <laughs> uh, okay. I love the presentation. I had I had seen the contrast of his car, the contrast of his cartoon animation video, and love to see how you follow through with this, uh, sorry, uh, I had seen the contrast of his cartoon animation video and love to see how you follow through with the experimental research. In the original, Noob Nichols and Roskies, if I recall correctly, the design was between subjects design, right? A contrast of this will maybe deal with different responses my mouse, my mouse pad is terrible. Uh, so yeah, sorry. Uh, if, I, if I recall correctly, the design was between subjects design, right? A contrast of it to maybe the. My God, if, Renato, can you read it? Okay, I, I found them the the, the midway. 
uh, different meaning of freedom from the concrete case. Would that be fair to say? But a contrast of it should expect people to keep giving different responses under joint evaluation. Has anybody tried that? And what would be Contrastivic's reaction if people were consistent under joint evaluation in a within subject study? So our second study was within subject. We gave them both the determined and the non-determined and randomized the order. Uh, and we still found this pattern uh, that we'd observed in study one and that supports the partial. Um, I do think that when you do it between subjects uh, that uh, you need to uh, take into consideration that different people might give different answers on different occasions. Uh, and so uh, there's gonna be some variation. The averages shouldn't change, uh, but uh, there's still gonna be variation depending on kind of the circumstances under which you're doing it, uh, what kind of mood you're in at the time, you know, if somebody just left you, you know, at home and you missed your air flight, you're going to be more likely to say they're responsible, they ought to be punished, you know, and so uh, there's going to be a lot of individual variation. So I think it's, you know, it's, I mean, I really think you ought to do it both ways, but you certainly ought to do it within subjects in order to make sure that, uh, that those kinds of external factors are not uh, affecting the answers. Great. Tiago, feel free to jump in. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your talk, Walter. It was amazing. Uh, sorry to go back way until the beginning because my question is uh, about something that was said right at the beginning. Um, uh, you, The first example, in fact, uh, the first example that you gave uh, to to make the point that uh, you, you, you to, to one of the counter examples to to the idea uh, that, 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 that you can be now. sorry can, can you hear me yes is it the one that's on the screen now oh, wait a second let me check the false uh, e, yes that's it that's good it. okay um, yeah uh, 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 the question that uh, Santiago asked um uh, you, you gave your answer but i'm not sure whether i really got everything uh, that, that you said about that and i was wondering whether one could say that uh the freedom that matters is that uh you're free to make the promise while knowing that you can't fulfill it and not uh and not the freedom to keep the promise and neither just the freedom to make the promise full stop not sure whether you you get the idea, and I'm not sure whether you um, the answer you gave uh, uh, to him uh, already covered that. So if you could clarify that, uh, it would be great. Not sure whether it was clear. Thank you. So um, I totally agree that uh, it matters that you are uh, free to make the promise or not to make the promise. Uh, and uh, that you are responsible for making the promise knowing that you uh, had no car and would not be able to do it. Uh, but that doesn't show that you're not also responsible for breaking the promise, right? Because after all, if somebody, you know, things might have turned out different, for example, your flight was canceled and he calls up and cancels the promise. He says, you don't have to drive me to the airport after all, the plane's not leaving, they gave me a ticket for tomorrow, I'll take an Uber or for tonight, take an Uber. Now, you still did everything wrong if what you're responsible for is making the promise, but you would not owe him the price of the Uber or a new airplane ticket. And so you're being, you you owe compensation because you broke your promise not simply because you made the promise right uh and the fact that if it's canceled you don't owe the same kind of compensation uh, uh is what suggests that does that help yes yes thank you okay uh santiago is ready again uh i'll i'll 
I, I'll pose my own question, if I may. Look, in a completely different uh, direction, though, uh, is, I'll call it a meta-methodological question. Uh, it, I mean, maybe uh, contrastivism works well with experimental philosophy because contrastivism work with proportions and that's all about, I mean, statistics is all about proportions. Yeah. The only difference, their proportions have a cardinal exact number and contrastive is a little bit more fluid. That will make your position weaker or stronger. Uh, so first, I just want to point out that if your question is meta methodological, then you're exemplifying the age old slogan that philosophers always say, anything you can do, I can do meta. Uh, and so um, I like that. Uh, I'm happy to go meta methodological. Uh, and the answer is with proportions, you can give a cardinal number. You, what you don't need, you don't need a cardinal number. What you need is sets and set theory. With regard to how free I am, you can say this constraint makes me limits me to this set of alternatives this other constraint limits me to another set of alternatives and we can talk about set inclusion actually amartya sin did this back in the uh, late 70s uh, showed how to do this um, i'm not technically sophisticated enough to do it but the idea is that once you look at contrasts and what it contrasts with you should be able to sign uh sets to what you are and are not uh, going to do under certain circumstances. And then the logic works that way, even if you don't have a cardinal number to attach to it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Great answer. Santiago again, please. Sorry. This was just a tiny follow up with the. Um... With the question that Tiago answered before, that, that he, he asked before. So you, you said, um, uh, well, so if you if you make the promise, but then the flight was cancelled, you don't owe compensation. And uh, but I think Tiago's point is, well, of course you don't owe compensation, but you don't owe compensation because there was no harm, not because there was no breach of duty, right. as it were. Um, it, so, but I think this points to a larger thing, which came up here and might have come up later, which is, um, it seems that in some of your responses, the way you're presenting things, you're trying, you're tying responsibility to punishment. And of course, then you get that big distinction between free will and responsibility. Um, I suppose another tack would be just to say, well, you, you kind of create a gap between responsibility and punishment. And then, and then you, you regain some of the proximity between free will and responsibility. So I was, I was wondering if, if uh, you know, just putting it in the context of Tiago's example, uh, you could just uh, uh, kind of rehearse that argument without appealing to compensation for the non-existence of the harm. Underwear. So um, let me first say that uh, I'm not really, I, I don't want to tie it to punishment in particular, because when I say I owe compensation, I don't mean that you can sue me in a court of law or something like that. Uh, what I mean is I would feel an obligation to compensate you uh, for that loss. I also think you would feel justified and would be justified in being angry at me. So it can be emotion as well. And I would be justified in feeling guilty. So yeah. I like to think of it following John Stuart Mill as liability to some negative sanction. But so, sorry, but let me jump in because I would feel angry. I would say, look, you promise all this. Yeah. They finally call from the airport to cancel the flight, but you promised this, knowing that you are not going to be able to fulfill your promise. You're a jerk, Walter. 
Sure. So I do and, get the entitlement to the anger. But wait a minute, because what my claim was in that situation, you are responsible for making the promise, but you're not responsible for breaking the promise. And so what you just described, that you'd be angry at me, what would you say to me? You should never have made that promise, you jerk. That's totally compatible with what I'm saying, because the fact that you made the promise makes you liable to a negative sanction, anger, I should feel guilty, but what should I feel guilty for? I should feel guilty for making the promise. It's another thing to say I should feel guilty for breaking the promise and not taking you to the airport and you missing your flight. That's a different thing. And we agree that I am responsible for making the promise and that was a jerky thing to do. And you have every right to be angry at me for that. The question is whether you also are justified in being angry at me for these other things, breaking my promise, missing the flight and so on. And notice that how angry you are depends on how bad it was for me to break my promise. It doesn't depend on how bad it was for me to make the promise because that was bad whether you missed the flight or not. <laughs> what it depends on is how bad it is to break the promise. That's where the level of anger uh, seems to be coordinated. I think I disagree, but I know Marco is there and I don't want to, I mean, I think this was great. This was a tiny point. I just, I, I don't want to make it about this tiny point. So I'm just going to let others ask. Well, and, you and I, you and I can do email about it because I know it's late there. My God, you guys are very persistent and I appreciate it because I'm enjoying this. Marco, Marco, you have the responsibility of posing the last question because we have Carolina and we are already beyond her schedule time. So go but for a good one. All, I want to challenge Carolina to translate this. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm good. I'm going to be Thank short. Job, Carolina. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, I'm sensible to Carolina's situation, so I'm going to try to be short here. I think I'm just the, the the philosopher who wants to strike back after the first the the former reply, and the the uh, what I'm thinking is. Uh, you uh, let's suppose uh, I mean, given all those distinctions you make of this notion of you know freedom, responsibility, and how they match each other, uh, and let's suppose that now you have all the data, as I said before, of how different folks use different locutions in different languages, and then you have all this mapping, this interesting mapping of, you know, as you said, philosophers. Uh, I mean, surprisingly, they're also people, and they must be talking about what people talk about. They should not change subjects and talk about something entirely different. But what they need is some sort of a, a, a conceptual grid, you know, a bunch of concepts that are sufficient or good enough to just kind of map onto, you know, folks usage and so that you can uh, say that, oh, this person is, is using this locution in this sense and blah, blah, blah. But let's suppose, I mean, as a philosopher, we are not constrained in any way to use uh, uh, any term in the sense in which you know most people use it. So let's suppose that I find this very peculiar sense of freedom that actually is very, uh, I take it to be crucial to answering the you know long free will debate of philosophy. And actually there is, there is only this small community in deep Amazon region that use a certain locution in the very same sense in which I, uh, I am thinking of, right? And actually I take that to be the really kind of crucial sense of freedom to explain a lot of philosophical issues, right? It doesn't matter if I am using a term that's only marginal. It's not, I mean, uh, what I'm, I'm thinking is uh, all this uh, research of folks usage, uh, they cannot be ignored entirely by philosophers because we should somehow uh, bridge our use usage of terms and concepts with folks usage, but we are not constrained to actually give more importance to the, you know, most commonly usage. Uh, so maybe that that was my point. And how do you react to that? Do you think that's fine? That's it. So I think there are two ways in which, and in one sense, I totally agree with you. Um, so I'll focus on that one. Uh, I agree that if 
that we're not constrained. Philosophers can talk however they want. Okay. I can say, well, I'll tell you what. I think that to say that someone doesn't act freely is to say they do it on Tuesday. Now I can prove that people perform free actions, but you just totally lost contact with what other people mean and why they care about it. Okay. So you have to be constrained by everyday usage. Uh, now, does that mean that when you're within those constraints that you have to talk the way most people do? Uh, no. Let's suppose that it's one potential usage within common language, you know, that's available. Well, now the question is, why are you deviating? I don't want to say you're constrained, you have to, but you at least owe me a reason why. And if you deviate in a way that's more precise than the common usage and that solves problems uh, by preventing purely verbal disputes, then I clearly agree with that because I've never heard any common person say freedom from constraint. They don't talk that way. I like defining notions, but when you define the notion, I think it's useful to show it's not like totally distant from the way people talk, as if you said acts done on Tuesday, and you also have to say that it's useful. Right, that it's important to punishment and our relation to animals and computers and all the things I did at the end, like I want to know why you want to talk this way instead of the other way, how does adding the precision work. You know when when Einstein said. Uh, all speed is relative to a frame. He had a reason for saying that because then you could predict things that you couldn't otherwise predict. And, and that's useful. Uh, so I want to say the same thing applies to philosophy as applies to science. You can distinguish mass from weight if you're Newton. And most people don't. But Newton did. But he had a good reason for doing that because then the laws end up a lot being a lot simpler and the predictions are better. Uh, so philosophers also seem uh, should be held to similar standards that you can talk any way you want as long as you explain it precisely to me and tell me why you're talking that way. Then, yeah, then anything goes. I'm a linguistic liberal to that extent. But I'm also a liberal that says you shouldn't do things that harm other people. And if you talk certain ways, you're going to be harming other people. Okay, that was terrific. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Walter, again for the beautiful talk. That was really um, very precise, very well argumented. Um, I want to thank our students. I mean, it's a little homage we have to. If you can, please turn on your cameras. Uh, and I want to I wanna, uh, mention, they are not just people, they are helping us with tech stuff. I mean, they are also, even if they are very young, they are already researchers. Victoria works with free will beliefs. Bruno works with the weakness of the will and Tiago works with metaethics. They are in our fields. I want to, for the 12th, 12th time, uh, thanks Carolina. Walter made us an invitation live and I made an invitation live to Carolina. Uh, if you were uh, running a version of it in Brazil, we need Carolina to make it <laughs> for English as possible, fluently and beautiful. And I want to thank, again, my personal friend, colleague, collaborator, Professor Renato Cardoso for closing ranks for this enterprise and obviously all the audience. Thank you very much, everyone. Sorry for any mistakes. Uh, sorry for any point we fell short. And thanks again. Keep, 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 tuned, keep tuned with our community. Go to our website, go to our channels. All talks will be available. 
please, please, please publicize it. And remember that we have uh, the first South American colloquium on naturalism, experimental philosophy, uh, July. We have the Mind Brazil brainstorms with Dave Papineau, uh, the metaphysics of sensory experience. We keep working, we keep divulging good philosophical content. And Walter, it was amazing. It was a pleasure. A big round of applause for Claire. Thank you, Gabriel, for all the hard work as well. You, you, you deserve a lot of praise for, for this. Gabriel. The main, the main yes. force behind all of this. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Gabriel. See you in Brazil Thank next you. time. Yeah, I hope so. Great. To cite a great movie, uh, Alejandro Jodorowsk, Everything is Maya, Z